Okay, welcome everyone. My pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Mario Herrero. Uh, it's, it's great timing. The, the topic is great timing. The speaker is great timing. Uh, this week is marks the, uh, uh, the, the beginning of the, well, not the beginning, a lot of preparatory work has, has been going on. Mario's been very much involved in that. But the, uh, the opening of the UN General Assembly's uh, uh, 2021 Food System Summit in New York. Uh, and Mario is a professor of sustainable food systems and global change in Cornell's Department of Global Development. And he's also a Cornell Atkinson Scholar, who's hired by the university uh, this year to catalyze new high impact global collaboration across disciplines. And his work is very interdisciplinary. His research focuses on increasing the sustainability of food systems for the benefit of humans and ecosystems. And he works in the areas of sustainable intensification uh, of agriculture, climate mitigation and adaptation, livestock systems, and healthy and sustainable diets. He's a regular contributor to a number of important global initiatives at the heart of sustainability of the global food systems, such as the IPCC, the Lancet Commission on Obesity, and the Eat Lancet Commission on Healthy Diets from Sustainable Food Systems. He's worked extensively across Africa, Latin America, and Asia before uh, joining Cornell. Also before joining Cornell, he was the chief scientist of sustainability for Australia's National Science Agency, CISRO. He's currently on the editorial boards of the Lancet Planetary Health, Agriculture Systems, Global Food Security, Agriculture, I don't know when you sleep, uh, Agriculture, uh, uh, I lost track, Agriculture and Food Security, Tropical Grasslands, Frontiers and Sustainable Food Systems, and he's been a guest editor for the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences Journal. And he's really been at the forefront of the development of integrated solutions for transitioning towards sustainable food systems. Uh, earlier this year, Reuters published a list of uh, the 1,000 most influential climate change scientists worldwide, and our very own Mario Herrero was among the top 10 scientists on that list. So uh, well done. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thanks very much for being here. Look, look, thanks a lot, Terry. I, I, yeah, I don't know what to say, but let me let let me start. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's great to see such a such a large audience. So today, I just want to to probably put some seeds in your minds around how to transform food systems and how this is a critical step for uh, really achieving global sustainable development. And where I would like to start is by really putting out there what we mean by a food system. A lot of people talk about the food system in a, in a very uh, generous way, but sometimes we don't really stop and, and, and think, well, what are we talking about here? What is the food system? Okay, so this is actually a summary figure from a, a, a number of figures, notably uh, the the high level panel of experts from the UN, uh, and also uh, some work that my colleague Jess Fanso had done in the past. Uh, but basically, you know, if, if you look at the food system, it's really all that you see here from most people think it is the global food supply chain, but in reality, this. This is way more, more than that. It's really the food supply chain, the necessary food environments that will deal with the availability and the access pillars, and individual factors also, like uh, behavior and diets, et cetera, that actually lead to food security and so on. It has a there's a very specific set of outcomes that we want to achieve when having actions in the food system. And these are all related to, well, being within a safe operating space for humanity, 
achieving healthy diets from sustainable food systems, keeping people healthy, uh, not destroying our farmers, you know, on the contrary, really supporting our farmers to produce healthy, nutritious food for the population, and doing this, no one behind. So if you look backwards, this is all mediated through what we eat and through this, how we manage all this area, food production, storage, loss, processing, uh, how we deal with the retail, how we deal with prices, how we deal with uh, getting food to places where they don't exist, for example, and so on. And then uh, starting to make behavior, uh, behavior changes, uh, get cues out there so that people can eat the right things and so on. This is obviously very much uh, uh, influenced by a series of drivers, some of which you, you know very well, well, biophysical climate and environment, incomes, politics, sociocultural dynamics, and a range of others. And all of this is very well embodied in what we call the Sustainable Development Goals, which provides a, a series of metrics for us to be able to monitor and account and check on progress. So which are the Sustainable Development Goals? These are the 17 uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, all, uh, all encompassing and multi-sectoral. But in reality, the ones that are dealing explicitly and directly uh, uh, with the food system are these eight. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, clean water, consumption and production, climate action, life below water, which is fisheries, etc., and so on, and life, life on land. The other ones are indirect. So it's very important to think what kinds of actions we can, we can do. Before I go into, a, into the heart of everything, I want to say something about the drivers. What has got us where we are at the moment? And it's really a, well, welcome to the Anthropocene, which is basically the age of human-induced global change. Just look at these uh, great acceleration curves, as Will Stephen use calls them, uh, where basically after led by population growth and, and incomes, you know, everything, consumption in general, has just skyrocketed in all sorts of forms. And this has actually ended up putting significant pressures on the use of resources uh, and everything. But it's ve very critical, you know. We, we eat more junk food. Our diets have significantly changed. This has all been fueled by trying to produce food at the lowest price possible. Then what can we produce at the lowest price possible? Kilocalories, sometimes empty calories, and so on, that end up in food environments, where in products that are very easily, uh, very easy to store. And you know, it's many times the cheapest option for consumers. So we end up uh, having ob obesity epidemics and a range of other things. So with this background, in terms of drivers of everything really uh, accelerating and even inequities widening tremendously. Let's evaluate a little bit the, the historical performance of, of food systems. How, how did we get here? Well, let's think about, uh, let's start with land use change because as you will see from the presentation, this is all very, very much linked to, uh, to land use change patterns and it's one of the critical things we need to we need to deal with seriously. So what you see is the evolution of cropland and pasture areas. And as you can see, this also follows some kind of a great acceleration as populations sedentarized and, and grew. Well, we started opening cropland, chopping forests, doing, doing everything. And now we've sort of stabilized that pattern. Why? Well, because apart from a Rainforests, uh, there is not that much super good arable land for crop production and so on. So in reality, the, the rates have stopped. Still, we're thinking about 3% of, of increases since 1990. And this is, this is actually, uh, if you consider that we have about 1.5 billion 
hectares of cropland, you are talking about uh, about uh, 450 million uh, hectares of land that have been in the process of changing. This is actually quite important because a, a prerequisite for achieving uh, zero net emissions is to really be able to stop this land use change. So it's something that we'll see in, in, in the future. Now, what has driven crop growth? Crop growth has, is, is a story of, uh, of different countries. In many places, uh, we've had what we, ha what we have called sustainable intensification, which is using less land but producing more, more food. And you can see this in, in the case of, for example, Europe. Asia, really, pr uh, most of the growth obtained from increases in yield, which is really very good. Uh, less progress in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, uh, where the growth in crop production has been mostly due to uh, land expansion. And uh, one critical thing to point out is that the rates of improvement are significantly decreasing. The rates of imp improvement in crop production at the moment in, in grain yield are lower than the population growth rates. So this will lead to, to, well, how do we manage the food system uh, effectively in the future in terms of cereal consumption and so on. And then there is the demand for livestock products. And here what I want, what I want you to see is that although you see uh, that from 1960 to, to about now, these lines appear relatively straight, well, in reality they're not, you know. It's basically a doubling of demand from 5 to 10 in many places, even in, in North America. And now the rates in some of these places are likely to, uh, to stabilize. But they're likely to continue growing uh, in many of these places. And then there's the big, uh, the really, really monumental driver, which is East Asia, where, as you can see here, uh, this is driven mostly by pork and poultry production the increases in consumption, and this has been led by increasing incomes in these regions, which have, are now uh, a lot more. They're, they're populous countries, and they're richer uh, relative to. So when, when you have money, you want to eat uh, animal source food. And that's what you see here. But just imagine the pressure on natural resources that this puts. This is significant. By 2050, the amount of cereals consumed by humans will be the same as those consumed by animals. And this is the first time that this will happen in, uh, in human history. So the feed food competition will actually uh, increase. And yes, it's not that we, haven't, that we have not been doing anything. Look, there's been monumental gains in terms of efficiencies, monumental gains in environmental efficiencies as well, and what you see here is, for example, an example, an example with livestock. We produce, uh, we need 62% less land to produce a kilocalorie with livestock, and we do this with 45% less greenhouse gases. But it's just the sheer volumes of production that are driving the fact that we are still in, in going up in terms of total gross emissions not even with the increases in efficiency we've managed to do this. To the point that uh, this is a recent, recent uh, paper by, by the FAO people, uh, and what, what they've observed is that food si emissions from global food systems are, are around 30 to 35 percent of the, uh, of the anthropogenic emissions uh, before we had uh, created this estimate for the IPCC, but they came and refined it very nicely, and they actually shown, well, it's still very much land-based. Emissions are the, the main aspect, uh, the uh, yield in these emissions is still production processes. It's farm gate stuff, it's land use, etc. The rest of the system contributes a lot, a lo a lot less, although energy is an important component and increasingly as, as, as we industrialize. Look at, for example, in industrial countries and so on. But you can actually start looking at this. On top of that, well, 
it's just such a pity that we haven't dealt well with the, with the food problems. Still 30 to 40 percent of food is wasted. Uh, in low-income countries, this usually happens at the, at the uh, pre-farm stage. And in OECD countries, this tends to happen after post-retail, post sell-by dates and all, all the regulations that happen. But there's an enormous amount of food waste uh, 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 occurring at the moment. Oops. Oops. Now, in terms of humans, what's happening? Well, you know, we consume more. We consume more sugars, more fat, more oil. We just generally consume way more. Now, in terms of malnutrition, we have greater rates of obesity relative to undernourishment. We have micronutrient deficiencies and a range of other things occurring. And we still have uh, 200 million uh, kids on the five still severely affected by, uh, by undernutrition, for example. Non-communicable diseases like heart disease and obesity are really increasing and are creating an enormous cost for, for our health systems, you know. Bearing disgust is a, is a really important thing uh, that, you know, that the health systems in the world are really trying to deal with. Hence, the interest, in, the interest in getting in engaging healthy diets from sustainable food systems as well. And then, well, we know the story of the planetary boundaries from, from Johan Rockström, uh, where we've already transgressed some of these boundaries. Uh, and this is all very much related to the environmental performance of, of, of the food system in general. No wonder that there's been a plethora of reports in the last, especially five years or so, dealing with this, getting the political consensus, getting the evidence behind uh, how we can actually uh, identify solutions for dealing with this problem explicitly. And I hope that I'm... I'm going to take you through some of these solutions now uh, because they are at the center of achieving global sustainable development. First one is uh, this whole concept of not attacking things from the supply side as we've done traditionally in agriculture, but trying to deal with healthy diets from sustainable food systems. So what do we see here? We see a, uh, uh, this is a classic paper from Tillman and Clark that demonstrated that, well, you know, what we eat, what we eat impacts uh, the environment and our health. And what they found was that different, we knew that different uh, pro dietary profiles had different greenhouse gas emissions and that this was the big difference where differences in land use change, you know. That's the really, really big difference and especially because for example when you have livestock products they're very land use intensive so what you get is a well by changing the diet is a huge land land use effect that then leads to lower greenhouse gas emissions and so on but what they did nicely was to take the extra step to link this to the health components and the health components well the diets also lead to a lower risks of diabetes, cancer, coronary mortality, and all-cause mortality. So just imagine what a persuasive argument it is from a policy perspective to deal with healthy diets and at the same time, you're, you're really at, at, the, at the link between three sectors at the same time, your health, your agriculture and land use, and, uh, and your food. So having to trying to devise policies in this space and trying to devise solutions, well, could, yield to could, could lead to multiple benefits. And that's actually why the area has been really, really important uh, in, in recent years. Exemplified by what? By, by many, many papers, but probably the, the Eat Lancet report, although controversial, really set a uh, many of the things that we're uh, really trying to achieve. What's the, the Eat Lancet paper telling us? Well, let's try to eat a very varied kind of diet, composed mostly of vegetables, but also of little quantities of animal source foods, nuts, veggies, fruits, and so on. Let's get 
a multicolored plate out there, and let's not make the steak the star of the plate. That's, that's as easy as it is, you know? Let's eat all, all sorts of colors, uh, and, and we will be fine. We know, we know that there's overconsumption in many places, especially of the, of the red meats, the starchy vegetables, and so on, as, and you can see it here. Uh, but not, uh, not everywhere, and that's really, really important, you know. We have overconsumption of, of many of the animal source foods, uh, especially in high-income countries. There's still uh, low-income countries that should continue consuming more animal source foods simply because they, this is really needed to prevent malnutrition, undernutrition, etc. But what we're definitely not eating relative to the, the 100 percent is the, the recommended eat Lancet diet. What we're not eating, which are really protective factors uh, for non-communicable diseases, we're not eating enough veggies, fruits, legumes, whole grains, nuts. This, these are all things, and it's a chicken and egg. You know, it's, we're not producing enough, uh, so they are very expensive. It's a supply-demand issue. And, but at the same time, uh, well, we don't have the incentives yet for increasing this production of, of, of additional vegetables at a lower cost. There is, there is a lot of thoughts on how to solve this issue, like redeploying subsidies in a different way and others. But you know, this is something that we'll really have to solve effectively. I've shown this graph before. Uh, but my main point of this graph, these were the scenarios of the Eat Lancet report. And what you see here is the planetary boundaries chosen for the study. And what you see here is the different scenarios. So the Eat Lancet uh, uh, scenarios dealt with three things. Uh, production as business as usual or trying to meet, uh, to, uh, to, to meet the yield gaps. Reducing waste and changing the diet to the sustainable diet. Now, if you look at the first line, the, the baseline to 2050, look, if we continue with the things as usual, everything's red. We transgress basically all the boundaries. If we just do dietary shifts, we're great on the greenhouse gas emissions. Why? Because we save a lot of land for, and, and those are really CO2 emissions. We also get rid of the methane. From, from livestock and so on. But ultimately, we need more land, we need more fertilizer, more water, etc. cetera, for the, for the nuts, for the veggies, for, for the extra crops, etc. It's not only when we really start getting into increasing productivity significantly, halving waste and the, getting the dietary shift, that we start really getting into this green space. And that's, that's a fundamental message from the Eat Lancet report that, look, diet will take us only, a, well, part of the way. But it's not the solution. We really need to keep on moving towards in the increases in productivity and the halving waste. Uh, okay. As I mentioned, the Eat Lancet diet is still too expensive for, for one billion people. We need to really sort this issue. It's still not the, uh, the leaving no one behind. Is still not, we're still not there. And we need to find a way of really incentivizing the production of, uh, of fruits and vegetables, especially in the regions that are most needed. Second thing that we need to do, we need to deal with climate change once and for all and without any excuses. And, you know, the, this is, I think that politicians have got the message now. And there's a very, very significant pressure to act across all uh, sectors. Now it's well recognized that we are dealing with, uh, this is beyond just energy systems. Just by fixing our energy uh, sources, uh, it's, one, it's one thing, but, you know, with 30, 30 to 30% of the anthropogenic emissions. We really need to th think how to deal with this. There's a whole range of things that we can do. And this is, you know, I've seen many, many of these uh, menus of solutions and their potential. 
potential deployment in, in some places or, or others. This is from the, from the IPCC report on, on climate change and land. So look, there's options. Where are the economic incentives for dealing with this? And the current options from a supply side are sometimes not necessary. So we, there's a whole uh, argument for having net carbon removals as part of the solutions. So we need negative emissions technologies in some cases for to be able to really get to the net zero ambitious or at least get us to where we want to be in terms of the 1.5 degrees Celsius. And as you can see here, with, this is a summary that the Royal Society did, yes, they did recently. And you can see the, the, the main things. First, reducing emissions from deforestation. Look, this is this is really still the big winner uh, when we're talking. Direct emissions from agriculture, a tiny bit useful. Consumer waste, uh, a bit dietary change, because the adoption of, of new diets, it's, it's really tough, you know. It's, it's, not, it's not a given. But you know, uh, rest uh, restoration, uh, rewildening, etc., improving forest management, soil carbon sequestration, a little bit, so carbon sequestration. In the, in the 90s, we thought that, wow, it was going to sol solve anything. But the, the, the truth is that there's relatively limited potential. But you know, it's, it's a question about reducing, but also uh, finding sinks so that we can deal with this. And also, it is about trying to deal with, a, with structural change. Structural change here is fundamental. and. What you see here, especially on this side, is the many options. Uh, this, is, this, is to, this is to 2050, and what you see, you get improvements in consumption of livestock and crop and, a, and doing all sorts of things, but the really big ones, like these structural ones, are all related to relocation of production. What if we moved and, and, and produce things where they could actually be grown at the highest efficiencies. This features in all the analysis of mitigation that people do. And you know, and, and you could supply to the other regions uh, the food by, uh, uh, by a good trade practices, while those regions could actually implement uh, negative emissions technologies in, uh, in their land and farmers be paid an ecosystem services. That is, that's at least the theory. It doesn't work in practice yet, but there's a lot of uh, efforts uh, going there. Then another, another topic is embracing circularity. It's critical that, that we embrace circularity. We repurpose, we recycle, we, uh, we try to reduce this food waste explicitly. And here's an example from, a, from the Wageningen colleagues uh, looking at the circular economy of livestock. There's, a huge potential for using food waste to feed animals. And then, as a result, you end up freeing uh, other potential sources of, 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 uh, of land. For example, the livestock sector uses about a third of the cropland of the world for the production of feed. So just imagine being able to, to deal with that. And what we see here is what we call uh, these boundaries. You know, this is the, this, these internal boundaries are where the game is. This internal boundary is if we produced animal meat only from a range, rangelands of low opportunity cost. We would be able to produce seven grams of protein per capita. Assume that a human needs about 50 grams per capita. Okay, well, seven, we could get somewhere. But this outer ring is if we could actually feed uh, to monogastrics uh, food waste, this would increase to 23 grams per capita. This is almost half of the protein needs of a human. What you see here is that some, some countries are definitely, well, over-consuming protein. Some, are, some still have a little bit of, of a way to go. But in reality, uh, circularity might not get there, but still for places like, like you know, Africa and, and parts of Asia, you know, there's still a very significant opportunity here. And we really need to deal with this explicitly. Then we need to address pandemics. 
and dress, uh, this is no longer in the in the academic circles and well sustainable global development needs to really deal explicitly with this so far until covid we haven't we hadn't had uh, this written explicitly into our formulations of what a sustainable food system looked like. So we're trying, there's a bunch of new initiatives occurring. One of them, for example, we're, like there has been a, a global burden of disease for humans that has been an incredibly successful project in terms of monitoring uh, how, we're, how well we're doing in terms of stunting, in terms of communicable diseases. Well, now we're trying to do the same for livestock. We're trying to really look at a, if we can establish what the global burden of disease, establish a monitoring system that will actually uh, monitor, for example, animal densities, monitor wildlife, uh, wildlife and, and livestock uh, interactions in different parts and start really mapping hotspot risks uh, areas where we can really start having early actions where, where we see outbreaks and things like that. This is actually crucial because, well, you know, livestock usually plays, is one of the hosts in many of these diseases, so we need to deal with that. Then there is the question, the question of technology. And deploying technology uh, at speed, leaving no one behind is, well, one of, one of the critical things, the leaving no one behind is still we'll see. But you know, there is a plethora of uh, options coming up. And I'm sorry for this, uh, for this slide that many probably at the back can't see that well. But you know, we, these are things that will be deployed in the next 10 years or that are very, very close to be deployed. You know, livestock seafood substitutions, insects for food, etc microbials, robotics, uh, electrocultures, molecular printing, you name it. There's a whole arsenal that we really haven't tested. What would happen if this were to be de deployed at scale? So it's quite interesting to see, well, you know, that there's a robust pipeline out there. It's a robust pipeline, but it needs to be incorporated into uh, just and ethical transformations of our food systems. It won't happen by by default. The Global Nutrition Report of 2020 put equity as one of the critical things that if we don't deal with, we won't achieve anything in terms of progress. And why? Because you know it's when you sit in 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 a in a round of conversations like the one that is happening tomorrow at the Food Summit. You know, it's government representatives from all the different countries and so on. And, you know, you won't convince the people that are not effectively included in the, in the discourse. The countries that are not included in the discourse will not sign anything. And they're absolutely right. If they're all left behind, vast... Uh, you know, vast numbers of countries of Africa, some in Asia, Latin America, there's tremendous resistance because, you know, they feel that their voices have not been included, that the, the kinds of measures proposed don't, uh, are not well designed for their food systems and so on. So we need to really embrace this whole idea of equity and bringing everybody to the negotiating table and recognizing that we might have different values in this. This is not just an OECD you know, it shouldn't go the way the OECD wants. No, absolutely not. And for this, you know, um, one of the things that we need to think of is probably what are the key elements? What are the key elements that we need to, to deal with? And what are the, the key bits where we really need to start having honest conversations to be able to build trust, to really transform mindsets of what, what we have to do? With many of those technologies, you know, uh, how do we achieve social license? It's not a given, you know, just look what happened with GMs, uh, ro robotics, uh, all sorts of things. And what we need here is transparency, dialogue. It's not about technology. It's all about so embedding this into real social processes. 
at the end of the day, uh, that's what ultimately politicians would like to see when, uh, when really uh, having to change policies, having to add regulations, how do we create the market incentives and so on. This is very nicely uh, depicted in a report that we did recently uh, with uh, Chris Barrett, led by Chris Barrett uh, from Dyson, where we call these uh, socio-technical innovation bundles for agri-food systems transformations, you know. Really being very, very explicit about uh, what we need to do. And one of the key things that we need to do is start to think of accountability really seriously. All the reports that you see have long lists of things that you could do. But there's never an actor. They're all, you know, anonymous. There's, there's somebody anonymously that should go and do this. No, un until we really start naming who should do what, we won't do anything. And that's, that's part of starting to keep people accountable. And that's one of the biggest changes that we have to, that we have to uh, elicit in, in the system. The other big thing, and believe me, this one is really coming in the next five years, you're going to see an enormous amount of activity. How do we internalize the true cost of food? We did some initial calculations for the food summit. The true cost of food is roughly about $29 trillion. Two thirds of the costs are not accounted for because they deal with environmental and health externalities. And be believe it or not, the costs to the cost of diseases is really in many cases higher than the environmental costs which is an, an enormous finding in the sense that a lot of people think oh well look it's deforestation it's biodiversity well the health side is equally important and you know when you start considering this it, you know there's an enormous amount of room for maneuver we have a new project also with Chris fund uh, about to be funded by the Rockefeller Foundation trying to see how we do better procurement, including the true cost of food. You know, this, uh, New York procures food uh, through a range of vendors, and it's not uncommon that they go for the cheapest source. But you know, but the cheapest source might be causing all sorts of environmental externalities, and that at the moment is not checked. Well, what would happen if we started checking for those? And then start procuring food depending also on how well they, de they deal with these externalities. Well, it's a way of attacking it from a, from a procurement perspective. It's not only just thinking of having to put, a, 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 to increase the price of food, which is what many people think uh, would need to happen. No, it, it, it doesn't necessarily need to go like that. And just so that you know, what are the types of externalities in this true cost of food? Because you're going to be seeing them a lot. Here you see a, a bunch of environmental, social, health, and economic effects with their endpoint impacts. Uh, I recommend that you, that you I, I'm quite happy to send you the report if you're interested in this topic. But uh, how to cost these and include them in the cost of food will be something that requires a lot of research in the next area. And I'm going to finish here with monitoring and accountability. You know, we, we cannot do this unless we really start having a serious monitoring effort just to see how well we're doing in different things. The Global Burden of Disease is a, a project fund from the University of Washington and funded by the Gates Foundation. It's a really good example of how to do this. This is the prevalence of stunting from 2000 and 2015. They're connected to all the health agencies of individual countries. And they can produce, for example, this. They, they do progress reports between different decades. But you can see, for example, the amount of stunting really decreasing uh, in, different, in different places. And what they, what they say is, is something very sensible. Look. Doing this at the country level is really not enough because the prevalence of stunting will be specific in some places uh, in, in specific countries. So for example, look at this, it, look at here in Ethiopia, look at, you know, in, in, in different places you get. So you need to have precision health, targeted health programs 
for these different regions. And this is especially important because the health budgets of governments in many of these countries are, are not big enough. So you really need to do some targeting of resources effectively to get to the people that really need the money. A more recent example, the Food Systems Dashboard, led by my colleague Jess Fanso from Johns Hopkins and, and Gain. We, we, Cornell, are involved in this project, supporting a lot of, a lot of the data products, providing information, etc. Uh, but the whole thing is to have a dashboard where you can go and find any information that you want about the global food system and about any country. So we're putting together all the data sources that we know. We're talking to the data providers so we can get periodic uh, updates of this data to be able to show uh, really, uh, well, how we're doing uh, across a range of uh, dimensions. That's an example of something how of a little bit of how, how some of the indicators look, that's ecological footprint. If you go there, there's heaps, heaps, heaps of information that might be useful for many of your projects and so on. And these are the kinds of things that, uh, that we're trying to tackle. Uh, we now have a new project called the Lancet Countdown on Food Systems. And this is actually a a project to really monitor key and essential indicators on food systems that will actually uh, tell us whether we are getting there or not on the different dimensions. So that's, a, yeah, that's, that's one that's, that will, will occur in the next, you know, uh, two, two, three years. You will see a lot of this happening. And the final slide that some of you have also seen and we need to do it now because the cost, if, the cost of inaction is monumental. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Mario, for that really comprehensive uh, look at the opportunities and the challenges of uh, food systems. Questions? We have uh, uh, about seven minutes for questions. I'll bring the mic around. Can you view a lot of the initiatives that you're talking about as adding to that $29 trillion food cost? The initiatives, adding, adding, to, the, adding to the cost of... Like you were pointing at Ethiopia and saying that they're getting stunted there, stunting there, as I... Yeah, as I understand it, and, um, and and talk about intervention, global intervention. Can can you regard that as adding to the food cost, the twenty nine trillion dollar food cost? Oh, the, the the cost of stunting will will add to to the twenty nine trillion. Yes, yeah. yeah. Professor, I was just wondering, uh, looking through your graphs, I noticed most of your uh, externalities are actually coming from developed world, except the land use. Uh, I was just wondering, as a leverage point, rather than uh, uh, like focusing on a developing world, is, do you think it will be have a better payoff if the focus is on the most wasteful country like USA or Southeast Asia? Uh, yes. So, you know, it, it will depend. It will depend where, where the biggest impacts are occurring depending on the externality. You know, so for example, if, if in Indonesia it is about uh, deforestation due to palm oil, well, then uh, that, that specific example, that's what in Indonesia will, would need to tackle. In the U.S., it could be nutrient runoff, uh, causing problems in lakes and things like that and so on. So the impacts are very different in different places. So we, we, you know, there's, it, it's, it's not that greenhouse gases will always rank first in, in, in all the countries. It, it really depends at the, the, state of, uh, the state of the different countries. Um, on one of the slides it mentioned, just like the impact of a vegetarian diet versus a meat eating diet, and I was wondering if there have been like ways that 
you have been thinking of persuading people towards a vegetarian diet or what you think would be the best way to move forward in that sense? Yeah, okay, just, just for clarification, uh, the vegetarian diets are, even, even from an environmental perspective, are not the best ones because you need a little bit more, a little bit of, pro of animal protein to ensure, uh, animal, pro animal products are so nutrient rich that you end up actually uh, with less land use if you include a little bit of meat than, it, than if not. But you know, you, from, your, from what you're saying, that, I mean, changes in diet in general. There's been a, a range of initiatives planned, for example. A lot of it is how you deal with the food environment. You get sometimes food deserts or places where people cannot really find. It's, it's a question about accessibility. Dealing with the food environment is really making it available. There's a lot of uh, behavioral cues or, or in terms of product placement and where do you put certain things. Uh, there's incentives and subsidized fruits and veg in some places. There's a big push for ensuring that public procurement has a healthy and sustainable diets. That would be, the, for example, the diets of, you, you know who implements one that's really relatively good? The U.S. Army. The U.S. Army have foods by, by colors in the, in the cafeterias. And, you know, and, and they all lead roughly to a sustainable diet. So, you know, the people can choose. And, and it's in these big offices, in, you know, here. Here, just imagine here being able to, for the cafeterias to, to have not just burgers, but have burgers and, you know, burritos and chicken wings and stuff like that. But to have a, a much broader selection of, of delicious food, you know, it, it that's the other thing, you know, we need to make it delicious for people to really consume it, you know, just, just a, a, a bit of cabbage and, uh, and a couple of almonds won't do, no. Thank you for your brilliant presentation. Thanks. I, I would like to know, because the world population, okay, the world population is growing. And uh, I realized that one of the biggest problems is deforestation and gas emissions from agriculture. But mm -hmm. we need to produce food efficiently yeah. to feed the growth population. And you brought up the number, which is 30, 30 trillions of dollars. So my question is, we need accountability, right? Who is going to pay for that, for that cost? And is it government, private sector? Who is going to pay for that? Well, that's, that is actually the, the research question that I said for the next five to ten, ten years. But you know, there's, diff there's different ways of that, that people are suggesting we do this. You know, it cannot be that this just translates into an extra cost for the consumer because then it's totally detrimental and what will happen is that the poor will lose. It's, it's, it's inevitable. So, for example, you know the amounts of, there's a big discussion and it will happen tomorrow in the food summit on whether it is necessary to repurpose subsidies. The subsidies, you know, the, 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 take the European, uh, the, agricultural, uh, the, the agricultural subsidies, take the subsidies here, you know. They tend not to change in a very long time. So you keep up with roughly the same structures. But well, that's according to a vision of a, a status, status quo of the kind of system that we want. Who says that they should be like that if we really want progressive change? Of course, you know, uh, you could imagine the kinds of revolts and, and uh, <laughs> people will, farmers will not be happy if all of a sudden you say that, well, uh, well, you need to produce certain things. Well, I'll give you the subsidy if you produce fruit and veg, not if you continue just producing maize, for example. And yes, I will manage that by also giving you preferential credit for you to do the transition. Things like that is what we, sh we should do. Microcredits, it's the same. You know, microcredits for, for rice. Well, why? why? Why why are we going to use our, uh, the land... Uh, 
prime land, like irrigated land, uh, to grow more kilocalories. What would happen if you structured those microcredits towards the things that you want? Or, or you say, well, look, if, if you plant carrots and veggies and tomatoes and stuff like that, I give you an interest rate of 2%. But if you want to plant, I don't know, a, you know, a potatoes with full-on nematicides and everything, well, your interest rate is 25. We need to start trying some, some of these different, different ways of, of, of changing the behavioral cues, changing the carrots and sticks so that to, create, to create this change. It's super difficult and it's really a... The Dutch are now making a, a lot of choice experiments in specific districts and everything, just implementing this in the real situation to see if it's possible that, that it will happen. It's one of the ways. We need, we need to keep on trying. Okay, thank you so much. We're out of time, but a great talk. Thank you.